When the credits to Edith Finch were rolling, my mind was on fire thinking of a ton of things. Real heavy and depressing things, like how weird my relatives are, and, and old family arguments that could have gone better, and, and death and the futility of latching onto memories. But on a lighter note, what I was also thinking about was how much I like controller gimmicks. Which means for days after finishing this game, I couldn't stop thinking of the cannery level. I loved the cannery level for the same reason I love controller gimmicks, for the same reason I loved hand tracking in VR games and motion aiming in Wii games. The magic of matching up a player's hands with what the characters are doing in a game is a never-ending source of fascination for a lot of the topics I dive into on this channel. Which means I love the cannery level from Edith Finch for the same reason I love the QTEs in Metal Gear Rising but hated the QTEs in Battlefield 3 and 4. But the cannery the level isn't just about the magic of matching disparate actions on screen with your finger movements in real life. There's also the magic of what a clear, clean synergy between matching up your state of mind with what your hands can imply. What Remains of Edith Finch is a small $20 budget game released by a small team who pushed it out from a kind of second tier cerebral artsy movie distributor. Despite being reviewed very well, I have a feeling this is the kind of thing that won't exactly be smashing sales records and won't be played by a lot of people who I genuinely feel deserve to know about this cannery level. Because it's basically the most brilliant little 15 minutes of gameplay I've done in years. This is the kind of thing that I feel needs to be preserved for future generations. This is an example of how to do these little control scheme set piece vignettes right. The cannery level needs to be canonized. So if you're watching this right now in spring 2017, maybe you owe it to yourself to strike the iron while it's hot and check this game out while stuff like this is still at its most impressive. But if you're watching this years upon years in the future may otherwise never get around to playing it, I forgive you for spoiling it for yourself. Anyways, let's clock in to the cannery. The cannery level is a brief chapter of a game that's already full of interactive short stories about the final moments of characters who more often than not die young and carelessly. And along the way, you're usually given some generous hints as to what's going to cause their unfortunate deaths before it actually happens, which makes a lot of their interactive gameplay control gimmicks create dramatic irony. In this case, players have to click and drag fish into this gnarly looking guillotine and, well, with that knowledge and this nasty knife permanently stamped on the side of the screen, you should pretty much already know how this story is going to end. The surprise along the way has the devs thinking with portals to create a second screen of gameplay superimposed over the first. The player controls a character navigating a labyrinth and eventually sailing a majestic ship across the high seas and touring a beautiful palace with their left hand while still clicking and dragging miserable poor little fish into the guillotine with their right hand. It's an attempt to convey what it's like to be daydreaming at work. Focus on the fish too much and suddenly your other character is stuck walking into walls. Focusing on walking out of the way of those walls and suddenly the fish pile up and block your view of the daydreaming. And good god did this trick work on me. This felt like such a painfully honest and accurate portrayal of what daydreaming at work is like. I truly felt like I've been there. God knows I've been there. I washed dishes through college and every day I just wanted nothing more than to go home and play some video games. So I feel like my hands have been there, my brain has been there, I've spent days thoughtlessly doing these same looping arm motions over and over again while my mind being able to wander was the only thing keeping me sane. And a non-interactive cutscene just showing this guy chopping fish wouldn't convey the feeling of that kind of mental multitasking. It wouldn't convey the feeling of how monotonous and second priority the work becomes compared to the daydreaming. Instead, having the player live a hands-on interactive demonstration of the grind between those two conflicting activities, that's a true exploration of what it means to explore interactive systems of real life through gameplay. The happy and intended result is that for 15 minutes here, I don't think I've ever related harder to the plight of a video game character. Good god, this stuff really stung, especially the little blips of snapping out of it to get some painful eyefuls of how degradingly miserable break room decor is. In an interview with the game's creative director, Ian Dallas, he says that the cannery level was originally much more complicated. You had other activities to multitask as well. Players would have to clean the barrel out and be chastised by a boss, but ultimately the team decided to keep things simpler and slash out extra gameplay challenges to just leaving in decapitating fish. The goal was for this section of the game to convey the feeling of busy work without actually being busy work. So neither half of the screen is really that complicated to deal with on its own. In fact, they'd be painfully simple. But one aspect of their earlier complexity that might have survived that cutting room floor is how these fish drop down at inconsistent intervals. You can't actually keep this half of the screen satisfied through pure muscle memory alone. 
because then you'd start to slide around nothing in particular. And the chaos of having to multitask two insultingly simple but equally distracting activities, at least one of which is complete utter drudgery, does such a good job of conveying what that feels like in real life. In fact, I almost suspect that any greater complexity and challenge here was cut to make these tasks feel insultingly simple. We are piloting a character who's supposed to be ashamed of working in this factory. This half of his existence is humiliating. And the player feeling a real sense of accomplishment of getting real good at working here would muddy that message. And while the cannery may be the most fancy and illustrative example of this for now, many moments in this game are full of that same kind of creative energy, where dramatic irony and dramatically different control scheme changes are playfully used to communicate the messages of these little stories. In a matter of seconds, your right hand can suddenly turn into the motions of a can opener, or a pop-up book, or one of the many eldritch eyes of a Lovecraftian abomination, or even a little flipbook animation, as you keep one finger held down on the mouse to apply just a little bit of pressure to keep those pages turning, just like holding open a flipbook in real life. And the game's dependency on linearity and its control scheme indecisiveness are not going to satisfy everyone, maybe not even fans of the usual walking simulator ordeals. But I think the lessons applied to this cannery chapter, what goes on for just these 15 minutes here, speak to just a little bit of truth that applies to almost all games. And that is that when your controls somehow feel like the actions they represent, and when the feedback on the screen resulting from that makes you feel something about what your actions represent, the end result is just pure magic. 